Howdy folks, long time no see, so to speak. Um, I want to apologize to everybody. I know I started to do a bunch of videos and get a bunch of things out, and it abruptly stopped. It abruptly stopped because I had to move and uh, take care of the family and all that kind of stuff. But once I was settled in, a few months later, I started making videos again, as you see some of the pictures here. And I did uh, some videos for how I did all this, and I had a bunch lined up, ready to post online, but then I got one of those... Uh, damn ransomware uh, viruses or whatever you call it on my computer and it locked everything out and as far as I could tell there's no way to really recover that once it gets gets to you so I had done as you see here a Dark Angels set did Terminators which were previous I did a uh, Rhino here uh, I guess a Razorback conversion with a uh, third party uh, turret there on it um, all custom painted and really uh, weathered out. Everything turned out real nice, so um, I could try and post the photos of what I have and just kind of do a walkthrough if that would really be of any service to anybody. But uh, the painting that actually went into it, there was a lot to it. and It was very disappointing to lose all that stuff, and it's really kind of um, deadened me to making more videos because obviously there was a lot of work lost, and that's always very frustrating to lose all that. So, uh, but we're not going to be talking about that today. I just want to kind of get this stuff out here. It's uh, about two minutes worth of just going through some slides here and uh, showing you things. But actually what we're going to talk about today is building a hex board or hex mat. Um, and I'm going to get into the details about that here momentarily as we go through the last little bit of pictures. Um, see I did some source lighting there on the miniatures. It turned out really very well sold all these on eBay to a uh, a good uh, uh, individual who was really uh, happy with the, with the product. So anyway, always check me out on my website. I still do do commissions, and I hopefully will get some more of these type of videos out. All right, well, on to the main event. So there are quite a few reasons I created a hex board. There are a lot of games out there that uh, actually need a hex grid to play. And in my opinion, a lot more tactics are applied to that. And as I've said before in my videos, believe it or not, I actually don't play uh, Warhammer or War Machine or any of those um, games. There's a few reasons why, if I could speak real quick to that, because it, it is relevant to, to the project is that the the movement phase I feel is is in a lot of these inconsistent what I mean by that is you only move so many inches a very specific amount of inches that you move and uh, after you get done moving say three or four turns the variance between exactly how much you've moved could be quite a bit actually I mean you get the tape measure out you measure yourself and you're off by maybe a quarter inch on some models, maybe up to an inch on other models just because you kind of measure the first one and then the other ones you slide into place. Uh, wheeling could be a little inaccurate unless there's templates. Um, so there's some inaccuracies, but when you check to see if you can make a charge or if you're in range for shoot, that's exact. Either you're at the, you know, the, the mark of the inch or you're not. And that leads to some inconsistencies. Not only that, but the movement phase can be very tedious and long in many of these games. So um, hex format games, uh, I think, uh, make that portion a little easier and lend more to maneuver over just kind of in your face. Uh, a lot of the war games, it's, it's really not very tactical. <laughs> I know a lot of people are just going to blow up at that. But it's not because there's no maneuver involved. It's it's straight attrition. It's you're facing off against an opponent, and he basically goes in. Sure, there can be a little bit of I come in at the side or or whatever, but you really don't put yourself in any kind of advantageous uh, position as far as maneuver type warfare goes. Is very much games of attrition. Um, therefore, really to to get a, a more grand scale, you have to have a grander size board. Uh, or, or, or battlefield, if you will. Now, 
in many cases because of the size of the miniatures you can only go so big because it is a war game it's not supposed to be representative it's supposed to be scale which means the trees are so high and if you can see over the tree then you can see over the tree it doesn't represent anything uh, the little two by two clump of trees in the middle of a warhammer board is a quote unquote forest that hinders movement even though it's still the scale and that scale really means it's two trees with a base of about eight feet thick that slows movement and all this other kind of stuff. Those type of things don't make a lot of sense to me. Because uh, is it really to scale? Is that just two trees that are clumped at eight feet apart, or does it really represent a vast forest? Wh which one is it? And a lot of the games, uh, war games out there, really can't make up their mind. Now, there are also a lot of uh, tactical games out there that have smaller scales. You know your th your uh, your smaller scale miniatures that allow for a little bit more maneuver, but in order to get the grandiose scale uh, of true maneuver warfare, you need a quite a large place to do it. So therefore, I wanted to make sure I built a board that had the ability to really employ true maneuver type warfare, and thus you see this board here in front of you. And I know this picture is staying up a while because I'm just kind of going into it of what it's for. Um, and then I'm going to go into the actual build of it. So this was created for a relatively cheap price. Um, let me go over some of the mistakes and the material that was used and then basically how, how I done did it. It's basically a, a very thin uh, piece of plywood. It's not even plywood, it's like a paneling piece of um, uh, board that I bought from Home Depot for I think about 10 bucks. Uh, it's got some 1x2s as a frame underneath, and uh, here we go into the frame. You can see that frame there, and again, that's just 1x2s, um, and I just framed it out so it would be a little more rigid. And then that outside board, you can kind of see there, it's a little bit doubled up. That outside board right there is basically... Um, just a one by three that overlaps so that there's a one inch lip around the board. Um, that's that's really all that's about. So again, the boards probably cost um, I don't know all all the wood together probably ran about maybe twenty dollars. Uh, the really expensive stuff came into what actually it took to to make the board. So. Now as we go through and actually look at the board itself, you'll see here the hex pattern. I'll sh speak to how I did that before, but we got some forest and some mountains and then the base itself. So the base itself is really just painted on a base coat of brown or green or a mix of the two and then flocked on top of it. Different mix of flock, I found that the green flock really doesn't uh, do a great job at making it look realistic. It's a little too green. So I used a mix of the scenic, uh, woodland scenics, uh, burnt grass and, and the really verdant green grass, I believe it's called. When I mix those together, it really kind of uh, did a good job. Here and there you're going to see little uh, tufts, and those are just your static grass. I put the static grass in there. Um, and then the trees that are on the forest, and I'll get to each one of those pieces here in a moment. The trees in the forest are purchased via eBay. They're for a variety of prices, anywhere from 60-something cents for a pack of three all the way up to about 5 to $10 for a pack of like 30 or 40. I bought different types to kind of uh, do some variation in there. Um, and... Uh, You'll see there that also in some of the places we have some uh, kind of rock outcroppings are actually part of the board. That was simply just a little bit of a spackling to make a little bit of a rise. And then uh, put some, let that dry, then you put some glue on top of that, put some ballast on top of that, let it dry again, and then paint over it with brown and then dry brush it to taste. Um, now note on that, when you do the ballast and you uh, kind of build it up with spackling, that's totally optional, but it does look nicer if you build it up a little bit. Um, 
be sure that you don't build it up too high and the reason is because the pieces that you put on top of that the mountains and the forest if you will are rather rigid so if you have a, a big elevation change you're going to have either the mountain or, or the forest kind of sticking up at an angle so to speak it's not going to contour uh, it'll only contour if it's slight other than that that's really all there was to the board uh, again glued some rocks here or there static grass little bushes on the outskirts I put some trees just drilled right in uh, hot glued some trees in no big deal the real work to this comes into actual making of the uh, the terrain on here so the forests are two things really it's a foam board a thin foam board a one inch one eighth inch foam board and it's sandwiched between two uh, foam mats. These foam mats you could buy at, you know, Hobby Lobby or Michaels or whatever. And basically sandwich the two. Now, if you've ever used foam board before, you will find out what happens that if you paint the side of it, the board automatically curls towards the side that got painted because it's contracting. So what you need to do is you get this um, foam matting and you glue it on both sides. That does two things. The first thing it does is it equalizes the pressure so you don't have a, a, a canner in either way. The other thing it does is that the foam matting is kind of tacky a little bit and it allows the terrain not to scoot across the board when you're, when you're moving your pieces around, uh, which is really uh, helpful. Um, now up close on all these pictures you'll see that it's not perfect but at a distance it looks quite good. Uh, to finish off the forests, uh, what you do is once you stencil it, and I'll, I'll talk about stenciling at the very end because that's really kind of what makes this a hex board. Um, you go ahead and you, uh, you you paint it off with a uh, glue on top of the foam matting. You have your sandwich. Uh, paint it with um, a little bit of uh, glue, watered down glue. Put some sort of sand or ballast on it, something very, very fine to give it a little bit of texture. If it's just painted straight on, it's going to look really fake. Uh, go ahead and put that down and then uh, let that dry and then paint whatever color you want over it and then add in whatever type of things that you want on top of that. I have some of those little leaves that you can get um, just sprinkled on. Again, I painted um, a thinned out paint, PVA glue, make sure you use PVA glue, over the paint to get all these things to stick. Put a little flock on top of it, a little bit of uh, uh, like the green ballast that you get the real fine green ballast and those leaves tufts of uh, grass or whatever here and there. Um, and the reason you use PVA glue is because PVA, PVA glue, when it cures, it cures non-tacky. If you use something like a spray glue or something like that, and this goes for the actual hex board itself, don't use that spray glue because that spray glue remains tacky and it makes the flock tacky afterward. So when you're making the main ballast, again, for the main board, uh, paint it, wait till the paint dries, and then go over it with a roller of thinned out PVA glue and then put your flock on top of that. That way when it cures, it's not going to be tacky and sticky, which is an absolute must for this. Not only that, but PVA glue has a better, well, it's wetter, there's more of it, so it kind of gets in between the granules of the, uh, of the flock and will hold it in place so that the flock's not constantly scraping off and coming off, um, which is obviously very important so your board will last. After that, I got a drill. I drill little holes here and there inside of the uh, the forest and just put the trees where I thought was artistic, if you will. Um, and that's really it, uh, when it, when it when it comes to the forest. Now, because the forests are foam board, um, they are a little bit thinner and you are able to bend it a little bit. So if you do put it over some of your micro terrain, I mean those little depressions that you make with the spackle, you can actually bend it so it, it, it meets against the board the entire time. Um, and again, we'll get to stenciling here in a minute, uh, but we'll go on to the mountains. So mountains are kind of the same concept, except a foam board, I use styrofoam. You get yourself a nice big piece of styrofoam, glue the, uh, the foam matting onto the uh, bottom of it, <clears throat> and then I uh, again went over with the, once I cut the shape, in order to cut the shape, obviously you need a you need a stencil. So you have to stencil it first, just on the plain white styrofoam. 
and then um, cut it out to whatever shape you want. <clears throat> you see there's a lot of terrain on here. You know, if I used it for a game, I probably would do less, but this is just kind of the maximum stuff, so I have enough, so to speak. Um, anyway, after after you, uh, you cut out the shape, then go ahead and again get thin down PVA glue, slather the PVA glue on, and throw a whole bunch of thicker ballast onto it, but don't be too thick, not a whole lot on the top, because as you can see in some of the photos, they're stacked on top of one another to make different levels of uh, of the height of the hills if that's part of the game, whether it's, you know, so high, if that makes a difference. Of course, by contrast, you didn't have to make this so rigid. You could, you know, shape it with either uh, a pin torch or, or something like that to kind of have some slope to it. But I chose this so I could have clear delineations between uh, the different levels of the of the mountains. Anyway, after the uh, after the ballast dries um, and the glue dries, then you just go over it with uh, a dark gray paint, and then maybe stipple in some browns here or there, and then start basically dry brushing lighter and lighter all the way up to maybe just a little bit off white. Gets you that nice stone effect. Uh, and then I went in and I did some ballast on top of uh, the the mountain pieces here and there to just give it a little more flavor um, and two different types of ballast like a like a ash colored and the green I'm sorry a flock uh, a green flock and some um, some kind of off green flock sort of speed to give some variation um, and then once all that dries then you're gonna stencil over it once the stenciling's done then you're going to uh, go ahead and uh, pop your trees in if you so desire. So stenciling, which is again the most important part of this, and it, it, it's quite important that you get this right. One of the issues with a lot of hex boards if you make it at home is that if your hexagon is off just a little bit over the course of the board, and this one happens to be eight feet long, it's four by eight, uh, you know that two, three millimeters that you're off on one side or whatever it is um, will actually turn into quite a bit at the end. What will happen is that your pieces aren't going to, your terrain pieces aren't going to fit. You're going to have to orient them a certain way and they'll have to stay that way the entire time because if you try to turn it <clears throat> so it's one of the other uh, facings of the hex, it, because it's not symmetric, it's not going to fit. So having a symmetric uh, hex is very important. So the way I did this is I actually <clears throat> did it off of PowerPoint. I created a hex and then basically messed around uh, inside PowerPoint and printed it out until it measured between all three of the, the pairs of the sides the exact same and then from corner to opposite corner the exact same. You have to get all those measurements the exact same and I mean within a tenth of a millimeter. Once I had that then all I did is I printed, I, I got in PowerPoint and I printed them out so I adjoined a whole bunch of them so they're sharing sides, made a hex grid out of perfectly symmetric um, hexagons. And then I got one of those uh, chopping board mats you see, uh, you'll see it towards the very end of the video. And I glued it on top of it and then I took my Dremel and I basically hit all the corners and basically did connect the dots. Uh, through the paper and through that chopping board. Once you uh, get done uh, doing that, you peel the paper off, then you have to go in with an exacto knife or a razor or something because as the knife goes through the chopping board, it melts plastic and creates these kind of like crater um, formations of plastic. You got to shave those off, otherwise, uh, the paint's not going to go through. All right, then once I got done. And I had my stencil, and it's not very big unless you get a big piece, you know, I think the one I had was about a foot and a half by maybe a foot, so I had to do the stencil a lot. You have to actually mark it off on the board. So you put it in a corner with whatever orientation you want. You can see my flat hexes face the long end of the board and the uh, angles face uh, from side to side, the short end of the board. You go ahead and you put it in the corner and then you get brads um, or really thin, thin nails. And you put them in at four spots 
on the four corners of your stencil, but make sure they're in the same position on each hex that they go in. So for instance here, as you see in my board, you see each side is actually made of five dots. You have the two corners, you have a center point, and then you have the two that are in between that. So if you can imagine, uh, I put a brad in, say, hole one on the left side of the hex, and then on the other side of the stencil, I put the brad in the same position, and then on all four corners I did the same thing. I would nail the brads into the board after the flock was done, and all the grass is on, and then I pick up the stencil off the brads, leaving the brads in place, position it one row down, so to speak, and then put the same holes that were on the right side of the stencil, when you pick the stencil up, I pick it up and I put it down into the same holes, again, on the same position on the hex, but now they're on the left side of the stencil. So now you, instead of having four brads in, you have two brads on the left side of the stencil. Make sure it's lined up and then nail two more brads on the right side of the, uh, the stencil and then pick it up and do it again. And what basically will happen is you'll have a, a grid of brads all the way up and down the board. The reason this is important is because it keeps it in place. And if you do it right, again, if you put it in the same position of the whole of the hex, what will happen is every single time you pick up the stencil and you put it down, it's going to overlap, at least on the portion that you just got done uh, painting, it's going to overlap the same exact grid so that no matter where as you go down and you move that board it's always going to be interlocking hexes. And this is how you get your hexes to, to actually meet. Um, this is an 8 foot board. From end to end I have less than a millimeter variance on this which means it's almost perfect. A little oopsies here and there but that's going to happen when you make it. Um, there's nothing you really do about that but it's very very low. Uh, and then I got some cheap air gun uh, black paint, again from Hobby Lobby or, or Michaels or something like that. Got my air, airbrush and I just airbrushed into the holes. Um, you'll see on s one or two of the slides I had a little overspray on the first time that I did that because the stencil, as you see at the end, actually has a hex grid goes all the way up to the very edge. Um, and I didn't mask it, not mask it, but I got a piece of paper and, you know, as a guard or a shield on the side, I didn't do that properly on the first time or the second time. Got a little bit of overspray. It's not too bad, but just a word of caution on that. <clears throat> and then you do the whole entire board. It's going to take a while. Uh, make sure that when you do the stenciling, the only thing you have down are the rocks, small rocks, and the static grass. You'll see some little bushes here or there. Wait until afterward before you put the bushes down because you don't want any elevation pressing the stencil up because as you paint, the further the stencil is away from the board, the more um, large the, the dot of paint is going to get as it goes through the stencil and it's also going to get blurry. So if you want a nice sharp um, uh, hex grid, you need to keep the stencil close as you can towards the board. Uh, again, I would really recommend using this um, uh, cutting mat. It's a little bit thick, but it doesn't uh, deform after it gets wet. Uh, it can take a little bit of damage, so it won't rip or tear or anything like that. And it also, it's uh, malleable, so it kind of contours to your micro terrain, so that you can always get a good um, a good contact with the board. And again, using that brad technique will ensure that even if you go over microterrain, that you're actually contouring to that microterrain. Now when you're stenciling the mountains, again, once you get done doing all the painting, before you put the trees in, you're just going to uh, place the, the, the stencil on top of the terrain. Now each piece of my terrain is as big as a stencil. I don't think there's any piece that's actually bigger than the stencil. So I didn't have to, um, you know, do do it in pieces. I was able to just put it down, I lined it up, turn it over, make sure I was lined up, and then again I stuck a few brads in just as kind of place keepers into the uh, the styrofoam to keep it from, you know, moving around as I uh, as I painted it. And then I just hit it up with the uh with the spray gun or the airbrush. Um and then for the forest it was basically the same thing. Um difference is is that I actually 
had the whole piece of foam board with the, f um, the foam mats on top of it, and I sprayed the entire uh, foam board sandwich, and then I cut it out. And again, um, you do this to get the shape down, um, same way that you do it when you're creating the uh, the mountains. And then once you create your shape and you put all the flock and your leaves and all that kind of stuff down, uh, then you'll come back in and you'll redo the uh, the stenciling, the exact same method as you did with the hills. And then you pop your trees in for both the terrain pieces afterwards. And that's really it, guys. That's all. That's that's all there is to it. I hate to say all there is to it. But the main expense came with the trees. Everything else was pretty dirt cheap. Uh, if you discount the uh, the trees that were in there again. You spend a little bit of money on that, depending on how much you want to spend, the quality of trees you want to get. Not a very expensive project. So again, about 20 bucks for the wood. Uh, the flock, again, I got off of eBay. I got two big shakers for about 7 bucks each, so that's $15. So we're up to about $35. Uh, the foam board and the styrofoam and the foam mats maybe came out to 15 bucks, So that's $50 right there. Um, paint was about maybe ten dollars sixty dollars I had all the static grass and the leaves already on me so it's kinda hard to say you could probably add another ten to fifteen dollars on for that depending on the amount you get and the type you get um, again it's reusable you're not going to use all of it on this project so it's kinda hard to say but say it's another ten bucks so you're up to seventy and then if you really want to go ballistic and get really nice trees, I think I probably have about $20 worth of trees in here. So it's less than $100. Is that a lot? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, but again, a lot of the stuff is reusable. I could use it again um, to make either another one, which <laughs> this took a while to do. Um, but uh, anyway, so the last few pictures here of the stencils. And you're going to also see the, uh, the, the sandwich foam. Uh, mat, and then the stencil over the plain mat, and then again a last picture of, of the board. One word of caution in this, do it over a tarp or do it out in your garage, because I found out the hard way that the dye they use to dye the, the flock stains carpet. Stains carpet actually quite bad. So uh, I had to go back down with a steam cleaner and clean all that kind of stuff off. So definitely do it and catch all the uh, the flock on top of uh, on top of the uh, tarp uh, when you do it, and then the very end, I just went and I just painted the uh, the wood on the sides to kind of give it a nice um, same way you would do in a base on a miniature, basically. Anyway, guys, tell me what you think. Uh, you could use really whatever size hexes you want. I used uh, 45 mil hexes. So I could basically put anything on here that I that that that, that I want. I'm not sure how many folks out here really use hex boards still. I know the hex boards that come with things like BattleTech are really hokey looking and they're not very nice, and it detracts a lot from from games that use uh, hex boards. I'm not sure if you call that a board game or if it's still a war game. It's a little debate over that. But this is a very good alternative. Again, if you have a lot of this stuff in here, you'll maybe be spending. Uh, you know, get 20 bucks for the wood, maybe 15 bucks for the craft supplies, and then whatever else if you have on hand. It's actually quite cheap to do. Doesn't take too long to put together. I did this all in the space of maybe about three days, and that's you know dealing with the kids and life and all that kind of stuff in between. So, anyway, guys, uh, again, I'm very sorry about not having a video out there for a bit. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to more miniature painting here soon. This is a project I wanted to do and see if I could do. I think it turned out rather well, but I'd like to really know what you guys think. And, and uh, if anybody else has any uh, good videos or tutorials out there on how to do these sort of sorts of things, uh, please post them in the comments below because, you know, uh, folks are seeing this, hopefully want to build a hex board, and I'm not the only one in town that knows how to do it. I'm sure there are other ideas out there and probably better ideas out there. This is just my take at it. Anyway, guys, I appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully this helped, and take care.